Hi, this Friday lecture is about one of the most important applications of the phenomenon of refraction, which you should already know from the previous week, and refraction is crucial for understanding optics, particularly understanding lenses. And where is a better place talking about optics than where I am right now? I am in the headquarters of the world-famous Keck Observatory on the Big Island of Hawaii, and we are now at the world capital of big optics. That's why I'm recording the lecture. It's really fun, and I'm actually standing here in the control room that operates the Keck 1 400-inch telescope on the summit of Mauna Kea. I'll go up there later today and try to take a two pictures for you. Normally, it's nicer to operate down here. This is almost at sea level here in Waimea, so that you don't <clears throat> have to spend the entire night uh, oxygen deprived. Sometimes it's uh, romantic to be up on the top of the mountain, though. And every instrument that I've ever used on all of the different telescopes of Mauna Kea, including the one that's on here right now, uses optical principles particularly uses lenses, very large lenses in some case. So today I want you to understand what a lens is, how it works. It's an amazing invention, how humans figured out, after knowing about glass for thousands of years, finally they realized that if you curved the surface of glass, that was a brilliant, incredibly useful practical application of optics. How does it work? Here's an example. This is pretty much your typical lens. There is a lens maker's formula which will tell you exactly how much light rays refract when they go through a lens. It's all Snell's law. I don't require that you actually know this in the course because it's not really required on the exams or on the MCAT. But I do want you to understand the basic principle. It really, we can take any kind of lens and just boil it down to one number. How simple is that? So let's look at what happens here when light from a distant object, this could be uh, <clears throat> an object a few hundred yards away that you want to see more clearly. It could be a distant star or galaxy. In any case, the light rays will initially be coming towards you from such a large distance compared to the size of your head, compared to the size of your eye, that the light rays from the far away object here, it's really off the side of the screen here, are coming in effectively parallel to each other. All right, I know that they do diverge. They're traveling out into sphere, but at this large distance, the sphere is almost perpendicular. And then you use a wonderful invention. Remember, the key to refraction is having an index of refraction of some material which is different from one. It's different from when the light is traveling through air, and that generally means higher. And what a wonderful discovery that humanity made when we found a clear material that transmits glass with a higher index of refraction. Water is one it's rather difficult to work with and hold into place. Ice doesn't stay very long either. My favorite one, all-time great human invention, it's got to be on the top five list, the discovery of glass and how to shape it. So there is glass with maybe an index of refraction of 1.3 or more, special glasses you could get higher than that, and it is going to bend light when it comes in at an angle, if it's not coming in straight, according to Snell's law. That's refraction that you already know about. And it's clear, it's transparent, so hopefully we won't be absorbing much less. Now, why am I so interested in bending the light? Here's my game with all of these optics that I'm showing. It was also the game with mirrors as well. But the whole purpose of this is to take light rays which are coming in parallel and to bend them, converge them. What I really want to do here is to get something which is going to bring the light rays to a focus. And if we design our lenses smart, correctly, then light rays coming up here at the top of the lens, the middle of the lens, and even the bottom of the lens will intersect at the same place. That would be smart. That would be clever. That would be very useful. Then we would have a focal point or a distance f little f here, script f is what it's usually called. It's at this point f, which is a distance f away from the lens. That's going to be the, there's the focus of the lens. It's a, here's the focal length f. That's all you need to know about the lens. By the way, as this uh, <coughs> slide says, obviously you look at this lens, it's kind of different from a mirror. Mirror, you shine the light on from one side and it comes back to a focus on that side. With a lens, the focus is, of course, on the backside of the mirror from where the light came in. And 
unlike a mirror, you could have the light come from the right instead of from the left. You could flip this around, and obviously the light, it's a symmetric situation here. So any kind of lens that you have, <coughs> still, <coughs> whether the light comes in from the left or from the right, <coughs> it will pass through. If it's parallel light, <coughs> then it will converge, and if we made it, if we designed the lens correctly with a very nice, smooth, simple curved surface, it's so simple, <coughs> it's usually a cross-section of a sphere. <coughs> If these two surfaces are cross-section of some spheres, <coughs> of some radii, then the light will converge over here at another focal point F on, it's exactly symmetric on the left side. So that's why, <coughs> technically, if you want to be geeky about it, which of course we always do in this course, there are two foci, or focuses, of <coughs> any transmitting lens. What you see, let's look, you need to look rather carefully at what goes on here to understand why refraction works this way. You have, well, let's take the simplest lens uh, ray here. It's coming in straight, normal, perpendicular, 90 degrees to the surface of the lens, duh. <coughs> it slows down when it goes through the glass because the index of refraction, who cares about that? <coughs> it comes out the other side straight also. No angles there. Theta is zero everywhere. Sine theta, zero. Anyway, um, no, sorry, theta is 90 degrees everywhere here, 90, 90, 90. So the le light just comes through here straight, no, no bending, no refraction. However, look at a light ray which comes in up here on the lens. The whole point of this lens is to gather some light, not just the light rays here, but also the light rays up here and down here. This light ray is coming in at an angle. See that little angle there? With respect to the normal, the normal to this uh, left surface here is this a dashed line. So it comes in at an angle to the normal, and Snell's law tells you that the larger index of refraction bends the light closer towards the normal, closer towards the perpendicular to the surface. So it is not terribly well illustrated here, but in the first hit, the first transition, you see the light rays here are going to bend down because they came up at an angle on this side, so they're going to bend closer to the black line. So that line inside the glass, it travels straight across, except now it's bent downward. Good, I've already accomplished part of what I wanted to do. But there's more, this is the fun thing about lenses. I could have just had a flat side of the lens. It would work okay. So as long as I have one curved side of the lens that has a certain radius of curvature, and then when it exits, it could exit a flat side, I would have achieved my purpose. I could have bent the, this light down. But there's a bonus here. If I'm a, a very industrious lens maker, I could actually also put a reverse curve on the exit side of the glass, as is often done, get uh, double my money here, double the use of the glass, because now the opposite effect happens. But now we're going the opposite directions. We have the light that was traveling through the glass lens still not exactly perpendicular to the exit surface here. Here's the black dash line showing the normal line to the exit surface and this light ray is coming at an angle. It's a little bit of a smaller angle now and so what does Snell's law say when you go from a high index of refraction medium, say n equals 1.3, back to air, n equals 1. The light then wants to refract away from the normal. So it comes in a small angle, and then this angle here, the exit angle, is going to be larger here. In other words, this second surface of the lens also, by it looks like in this case they're symmetric because the lens has been uh, polished the same on both sides, it's going to bend by the same angle downward. You got it. Downward again. So one bend downward here, another equal bend downward here, and now this light ray is really going down. What happens to the light rays on the bottom? Exactly the opposite, because they're coming in where they're facing a surface which is curved, which is tilted the other way. So this light ray, when it hits the first surface, bends up a little bit, closer to the normal, and then it bends up more at the exit surface, going further away from the normal here. So we've done exactly what we want to do. If we polish this lens, basically you just have to polish this lens uh, symmetrically. Uh, as I said, the cross section of a sphere is the easiest to polish. It's what everybody always does, and except for very fancy cases. So we'll have the further the, the light is up, the more it gets bent. The closer to the middle is, the less it gets bent. And the more down here, the more it gets bent up. A perfect formula to have all of these different light rays converge at the same point. That's what we want, at the same point. That's where the magic happens. If, if the light converged, if, the, if they it crossed the axis at different places, that would not be a very good lens. It would have a, a fuzzy, 
focus. Actually, in real life, that happens sometimes, but this is, this is the ideal case. In all of what I'm going to be telling you now, I'm making an assumption here, by the way, that this lens is actually quite thin and that all of these angles here, thetas, theta ones, theta twos, theta in, theta outs, are relatively small angles so that sine theta is approximated by theta. But I don't think you really need to know that very much. Uh, if these lenses were really huge, as you sometimes find at the top of Mauna Kea and some of the cameras up there, then you'd need a somewhat more complicated formula. But the basic idea is the same. So now we see we have got a lens, and I'm just going to characterize it by this focal ratio f, which is directly related, by the way, to the radius of curvature of these surfaces. But you don't need to know that for right now. The same way you have with a mirror. The ratio is a factor of two. Here's a few different kind of lenses that you could uh, uh, grind in your glass grinding shop. This one is the same as I showed you. It's convex on both sides here so that both sides do the converging of the light rays. Here's a, a lazier one where you just uh, polish one side so it's got half as much converging power. In other words, this one is going to have twice as long a focal length but it'll eventually do the job. This one is a rather complicated one because the first curved surface converges the light if it's coming from the left, but the second exit surface, just happens here, is also curved the same way, so that second surface will actually tend to diverge the light a little bit. So the second surface cancels out a little bit of the curve in the first surface. These would be a special purpose mirrors. This is the diagram I showed you before. Notice how analogous this is to the mirror case. Really, it's quite analogous. You have parallel rays coming from distant object on the left. They reflect off of a mirror. In this case, the mirror is also a cross-section of a circle, so it has a certain radius of curvature, and the radius of curvature is out there. And the focal point here roughly, especially if this was just a small angle, the focal point roughly here is about the radius of curvature over 2. That's all it is. Hmm. Just as a convex mirror produces an image here, sorry, that's a concave mirror, convex lens does the same job. You remember that a more sophisticated, more complicated, sophisticated, a different version of a mirror was a convex mirror that was curved this way. In other words, has what do you call a negative focal length. Would that be of any use? with polishing lenses, you think it might be useful to polish a concave lens where we actually hollow out a cross-section of a sphere on the left and a cross-section of the sphere on the right here. That might be useful also. Let's go with that. Remember in the case of my convex mirror here, what happens is it's all about bending the light rays. They come in parallel, but they go off this curved surface, and instead of converging, they diverge. They bounce off here. The, high, the higher up it is, the more up it goes. The one in the center bounces straight back, and the lower it is, the more down it goes. So the higher the ones, they bounce up at an angle, the lower rays bounce down an angle, so the light that was parallel diverges. We could do the same thing with the lens here if we polish it in this concave way. See how that works? It's exactly the same diagram. The straight uh, middle light ray comes straight through, hits at a 90 degree angle, perfectly normal, goes straight through. But a high ray hitting at a big angle from the glass here is refracted up when it goes into the high index of refraction, and then as it exits, because you've got the reverse curve on, it's bent even more up. So one bend up here, another bend up here, and opposite happens at the bottom. It bends down a little here and down even more there. Actually, you can see, <clears throat> does this have a focus also, assuming that these are symmetrically polished, like cross sections of spheres? Yes, this also has a focus, but it's going to be a virtual focus because the light rays, if the light rays are diverging, of course, any set of diverging lines, you can trace them backwards, even if they didn't travel this path. Your eye could trace them backwards mentally to where they must intersect. Diverging lines must have intersected at a point, except that here the point is on the left side, the back side of the lens. That's a virtual focus or a virtual image there. And again, it has a focal length f. We'll just use the same terminology pretty much as with mirrors. And 
The only difference we're going to, for the convention here, let's go with a fairly intuitive convention. If the focus, if it's a converging lens, so the focus is on the other side from the way the light entered, then we'll call that a positive focal length here in meters or centimeters or inches or whatever you want, but it's usually in metric units. If we have a diverging lens here, then the focus is actually back on the uh, entrance side of the light, so we'll call that F a negative focal length there. Diverging or concave lenses have negative focal length. That's pretty analogous to what we had with the mirror, except the curvatures are different. <clears throat> Let's see if you understand this. Quick little question. I've never actually seen this in real life. It's just a thought question. Suppose you're scuba diving and your friends have some kind of fancy plastic bags that can be inflated into rigid uh, volume. This is under. This is water here, so that is a high index of refraction. But this is air inside the bag here with an index of fraction of one. And in this case, they've inflated the bag to have a positively uh, a concave convex surface on the left, convex surface on the right. That looks kind of like a lens, except it's the opposite of what I showed you before, because it has low index of refraction in a high index of refraction of medium. This is the opposite. I don't know how they engineered this, uh, this bag <clears throat> underwater. This bag has a concave curvature on both sides of it here. And so suppose that the light rays come in either the right side or the left side through the water. In one, it's pretty obvious that the light rays that come in parallel are not going to stay parallel. And the question is, and it looks like they're going to do opposite things for uh, situation A and situation B. Which one is it, A or B, which will have parallel rays converge as they pass through the air? Think about that a bit. All right, that's enough time. You can pause this if you want, but I'm going to now tell you the answer. This should be just the opposite of the case that I showed you before, the normal case where this was a glass lens with a high index of refraction surrounded by air. We've got the opposite here. So, for example, let's just take one light ray and then you'll understand the whole deal. This light ray here is traveling horizontally from the left, hits the surface here, and it's hitting it at an angle. And now, because it's in the air, it wants to not keep on going straight, like that. It wants to bend away from the normal, the perpendicular to the surface. It wants to bend up. And then it comes at an angle there. And then it's still at an angle with respect to the normal. As it hits the high index of refraction of the water, it wants to bend closer to the normal. It wants to bend up again. So we have one bend up here, another bend up here. Yes, that's right, as you might have expected. This is exactly the opposite of the glass lens case. This geometry of two convex surfaces is a diverging lens. So this one here, the concave airbag, is the one, is the correct answer. B is the one that will converge. Let's see if you want to look at the light rays that go through it. There they are, <clears throat> just what I said. In the concave case, this light ray bends away from the normal, and then again, it, it hits the dense surface and it bends towards the normal. That's two bends down. Opposite happens up here. So the there's your converging lens, which could in principle, I've never seen these made, in principle it could focus light with a positive focal length, F. Now <clears throat> we have to keep track of all of the different rays, actually just the main important rays for a lens. If you can keep track of these, this diagram here, you'll be able to handle all of the drawings, all of the geometry that you need for this course. So this, this, is a, <clears throat> this doesn't have a formula on it, <clears throat> but it's got all the geometry, pretty much, that you need to know for this chapter. And it tells you how both kinds of lenses, with a positive focal length F here and a negative focal length here, will make images. Let's look at the more intuitively easy one, to me at least, of the top one, uh, positive focal length here first. We'll put a, and just for convention, I always put the object on the left side, the light's coming in from the left side, obviously, uh, in the problems, <laughs> the object might be on some other side, and you'll have to figure that out. What are the key rays of light coming from the object that you need to know? 
Well, there's the tip of the object. Of course, it's sending light rays in all directions. But we only really need to consider here three light rays. Let's have one light ray that goes parallel to the optical axis. The optical axis connects the base of the object to the middle of the lens. So here's ray one going parallel, and it hits the light ray. We know that's going to bend down a lot the most because it's hitting at a steep angle here. It's going to bend down. Since it was a parallel ray, I know where this is going to go on the right-hand side. That's why I picked the parallel ray, right? Parallel rays, by definition, they're going to converge and hit the optical axis at the focus, one of the foci, the focus of this lens. So that's a distance f from here. So I know the path that object one has to take. It has to go through the focus after it hits the, the thin glass lens. Uh, let's do a, a real trivial one now. The light ray that goes from the object straight through the center of the optics. Center of the objects, that's re light ray three. That one's very easy. I've shown you basically how that one works with this diagram here on the right-hand side, just to remind you. Remember, yes, it's hitting at an angle as it enters here, and so, yes, actually, this graph doesn't really show it very well. It's going to curve, when it hits at an angle, it's going to curve a little bit closer to the normal going through the glass. But notice, because it was this is a special ray, it's going right through the center of the glass. Just at the center of the glass, the surface here, remember these angles are small, the surface here is exa almost exactly parallel to the surface here. Not true here. They're tilted with respect to each other, but here they're just about parallel. It's just like a flat parallel slab of glass right in the middle. So yes, it bends a little bit refracting uh, this way when it goes through the glass, but all of that is exactly canceled out and compensated when it exits back into the air, the low index of refraction. So going through the, it, it puts a jag, a little kink in the path, which is not actually shown here. It goes down a little, jags back out, but still, remember, all of these angles are assumed to be small. This glass is assumed to be very small here for all of my ray tracing. So pretty much it comes out at the same angle it went in. It's coming down at this angle, it's going to go out, exiting at that angle. How trivial is that? Here's a fun one. This is maybe the least obvious one. Let's take for our, our last ray, we'll call this ray 2 here in the diagram. It's a ray that emanates from the tip of the object and goes through, it's interesting, this goes through the other focus of the lens here, which is symmetric. So there's one fo by the way, the two foci are symmetric here, even if this lens is not symmetric. You could have a lens that had uh, a, a steep curvature on this side and then a large radius uh, of curvature on that side. It would be a sort of an asymmetric lens. Or you could have a plano convex lens where one side is straight and the other side is curved. Doesn't matter, they still have two foci, one at focal length plus f, and, and then this other focus would be for light that was traveling from the right to the left. Why did I send the light ray through here? Why? Because I know that any light that goes through this focus should do an exact reverse or mirror image of the light ray of path one. Going through the focus means that the light originally was parallel to get there. That's the definition of the focus. So this light ray, if you trace it backwards, it must have been coming parallel to the optical axis on the other side of the lens. Suppose that there were light rays, parallel light rays coming from the right. We know what would happen. They'd hit the lens here, they'd refract a lot, and they'd hit the optical axis and converge at this focal point F prime. So just tracing back the other way, I know that a light ray that passes through F prime, this light ray 2, must end up parallel here. So that's how we knew that this one had to be at the same angle, this one had to go through F, and light ray 2 had to come out parallel. And you notice this is drawn pretty accurately for small angles. All three of these light rays, and by the way, all light rays in between that I didn't bother to draw because they're not so easy and not so interesting, all these light rays converge not at F, they converge further back here, Ta-da! They converge at this point on the bottom of the optical axis. They start at the top of the optical axis. They've converged here at the bottom of the axis, and that is the tip of the image formed by the lens of the object. So we'll call that I, and there's the tip of it, and there's the, the foot of it there. There's your image. We're going to call that a real image because this is the, it's at the point 
where real light rays actually traveling through the optics would actually converge. That makes a lot of sense to me. The next one, I always get a little bit shakier with virtual images. Maybe you too, if you're like me. Um, so let's try the same trick when we have a diverging lens here. We'll send three light rays towards the diverging lens, and of course they're going to diverge, duh, not converge like these. What's going to happen there? Uh, let's do the very simple one first. You have the light ray number three, which is going through the center of the optics, and we know it just it puts a little jag right there, which is very small, and comes out at the same exit angle that it came in. That goes right through the center. That's your ray three. Ray one, fairly simple here. It, dive, it was a parallel ray to start with, so it diverges. But we know that if you were to trace this backwards, that light ray would appear to be emanating from F, the focal point at the focal distance from this lens. Oh, it's on the left side because, yes, this diverging lens has a negative focal length. So, yes, that is where the focus would be. The light, of course, only appears to be emanating from there. So, this is a dashed line. Dashed line shows where the light appears to have started, although it's actually traveling now on one. Actually, this is a small eyeball here. You need a big eye here to see that actually the light appears to originate from F. How about two? This is the most complicated one here. This is a somewhat complicated diagram. Two is the light ray emanating from the tip of the object aimed at the other focus on the other side, symmetrically, an equal distance on the right side of this lens. That's the same way as I did here with this ray. I sent some light towards this focus and saw that it ended up being parallel. Well, this light that's headed, this ray two, that's headed towards this focus is going to be bent parallel to the optical axis. So it'll come out at two. Trace all of the diverging light rays paths back. Diverging rays, you can trace them back, must have intersected. And it turns out that all rays, one, two, three, and all rays in between appear to have diverged from one single point, which is shown right there. See where my, where my cursor is? Right there is the intersection point. Ta-da! That's the tip of the image formed by this diverging lens. The light rays did not actually take that path, but after the light rays went through the optics, they appear to have emanated from that path, and there's no way you can tell the difference, even if you had a very sophisticated eye. The light rays have formed an image, but it's a virtual image on the left side. It's on the same side as the light rays originated. So we'll call that image a negative distance. Image distance di is negative in this case. Image distance here, we'll call that our convention. It's a sign convention. We must be consistent with our sign convention or we'll get the problem wrong. We'll call this a positive image distance di. That's your ray tracing geometry. That's about as hard as it's going to get for geometry. In at least one of the problems on the exam, uh, I'll give you one of these situations and ask you to trace a few rays and see where they intersect so that you can figure out where the image is. If you're not exactly sure about sign conventions, go with the ray tracing. That way you can never really get it wrong. If you trace your rays the right way, then you'll figure out where the image is, whether it's virtual, whether it's real, whether it's inverted upside down here or upright like this one ray tracing even if you get the signs wrong don't understand the mathematical formula the geometry won't lie to you here's the formula though <clears throat> this is very useful too because i didn't say exactly where the image and where the uh, compared to where the object was here's the formula this formula should look so familiar to you look at this We've got the object distance. I put the object here with its base here and its head over here. Uh, it's a height h object, and it's a distance d object, do, on the left side of the lens. I'm back to the simple convex lens here with a positive focal length. The positive focal length here, you see, is script f. And there's a great symmetry. There has to be a great symmetry in this formula. Here is the distance to the image, 
that happens in this case to be formed on the opposite side, the right-hand side, it's a real image, of the converging lens. And so that's a distance di on the other side. That's where, these are just two rays. I didn't even show you the light ray that went through here and converged. But anyway, all of the light rays converge over here that were emanating from O prime, the tip of the object. They all converge at I prime over here. And that is a height h i, and it's a distance di away. Look at the symmetry in this formula. Why does it have to be symmetric like that? Because this lens is symmetric. I could have traced light rays. This could be my object here. Suppose I just stuck an object that was upside down here and saw where the light rays uh, emitted from here. They would travel exactly the same path and the reverse this is all reversible and they would make an image over here. So DO and DI can be swapped in this formula depending on where the, where the light uh, emanates, where it originates. This has to be symmetric. If you have DO and DI differently in your formula, you made the wrong formula here. You take the inverse of DO and the inverse of DI. I'm not going to demonstrate the geometry. It's just a bunch of triangles and sine curve, you know, sine law approximation, sine theta equals theta, and so on. Anyway, here's your formula. You add the inverse of DO and DI, and that equals the inverse of F, the focal length. And this formula, like I said, should look so simple because it's the same formula, basically, that we had for image formation by a reflecting mirror really just the same. And another thing that's very much the same is if you take the height of the image, hi, then the ratio of that to the actual height, ho, of the object, hi to ho, is of course still the magnification of this lens in this situation. There's a magnification and by uh, similar triangles here and similar angles, hi over h object is equal to di over d object, right? If di is smaller here, then you actually, compared to do, you have a demagnified image, magnification less than one. And sign convention, I put a minus sign here because in this situation, the image is inverted. So hi is actually negative of ho. That's a sign convention. That's a sign convention we're using in this course. So that's how come the minus sign. So this formula and this definition of magnification is pretty much just about all you need to solve most problems, as long as you know what you're doing and what all of the variables are. I'll give you two of the variables and ask you to solve for a third variable, typically. But I do want to warn you, try to think about what you're doing instead of there is a great tendency to absolutely plug and chug on this formula. And it will generally work, but um, it's very easy to make mistakes, particularly of sign. And so if you think about what you're doing, and maybe if you have a diagram to guide you, then you won't get in trouble with this formula. It's always true. The most common ways to get tripped on this formula are by getting mixed up on the conventions. I get mixed up on the conventions sometimes. I'm sure you will too. But by practice, um, that won't happen on the exam, right? Let's see about the sign conventions. It's, we have to do a little different because this is a transmission optics, unlike a reflection optics of a mirror. Let's see. For a converging lens, I told you intuitively to me, I thought it made sense that we'll make f, script f, the focal length of the lens, be positive when it converges, negative when it diverges. And if I keep the object over here on the left side, and that's where the object is, then that corresponds to a positive object distance, do. di, this is a change from a mirror, di is the distance to the right side of the lens. And that's positive if the image forms on the opposite side where the light came in, because I'm kind of expecting a, a lens to form an image on the opposite side. It's the opposite of a mirror, which reflects the light back to the same side it came from. Here, DI is positive if it's on the opposite side of DO. Of course, in a virtual image where the light rays, not this lens, but a concave lens, the light rays diverged, then the image was actually on the same side as the object. It's a virtual image, and that had a DI which was negative. You got that. That was the, that was the other case I showed you. DI could be negative in this formula. Formula still give you the right answer anyway. Just have to be careful. And then as I explained to you, if H image is actually below the optical axis. This one is above the optical axis. We're going to call this positive here 
if the image is upright, but this one is inverted, so HI is negative. Notice in my formula, this one is negative, this one is positive. So in the case I'm showing you here, we have actually a negative magnification. This is positive, and in the drawing here, this is positive, this is positive. A minus sign here correctly shows me that the magnification in this case is negative. And the reason the magnification is negative is, also it's less than one, that's totally different. It's a demagnification, but the demagnification is negative because this image here, in the case of the converging lens, is upside down compared to the original. And then, of course, you also see that in the magnification here. So there's our definition of magnification. If the magnification is negative, the image is inverted, and that's what I showed you here. That's all your sign conventions. You really have to take these to heart. You've just got to have these. Uh, you can write them down, but I mean, you must understand these. You must totally absorb these. If you absorb and understand these definitions of sign conventions, and you've got your formula here, in principle, you can solve most of the problems I'm going to throw at you, even if you mess up a bit and lose a point on your geometry, on the ray tracing, because this formula is always going to be true for any kind of lens, any kind of thin lens. Now, I didn't show you all of the ray tracing that you could get in these situations. There are many cases. In this case, I have a converging lens, so that it's F positive, and I started out with DO, the object, being placed at quite some distance. In fact, it was more than twice F away from the lens. But of course, what happens as I move this object closer and I make DO smaller, what happens in my formula? You should be familiar. We did the same deal with mirrors here. You make DO smaller. This fraction then is the inverse of that gets bigger. This is fixed. We're not changing the optics. We're not repolishing in the middle of this. That's fixed. So if this gets bigger, to still maintain the equality, this much gets smaller. How does this get smaller? DI had to get bigger. So as I push the image closer here, this image gets pushed out gradually further to the right. So DI is going up and DO is going down. That's interesting. What's happening to the magnification as I push the object closer from a long distance away towards the focus here? Ah, this ratio is going up. Magnification is going up. It started out actually demagnifying. It was a demagnifying lens, but as I push this over to the right, it's going to demagnify less, and you can guess what's going to happen. Eventually, if I get it close enough, it's going to start magnifying. It's going to be a magnifying converging lens. Here's the different cases, and something very special happens when you move the object through F and also through twice F there, which is the radius of curvature if this was a mirror. So if the object is a long way away, we've seen this now a few times, a this is a summary for a converging lens. So F is positive here. If the object is a long way away to the left, then you get a real image, but it's inverted and it's demagnified. But then if I push it closer, let me look at that closer, so that the object is less than 2F away, but still more than F away, I still have a real image, it's still inverted, but now the magnification, which was 1 when I was at 2F, now starts getting positive. Magnification is going up, it's more than 1, I'm actually using this as a magnifying glass. It's an enlarged object, M greater than 1. Actually, sorry, M is more negative than minus 1, because it is an inverted image. And finally, I can't make a real image if I get inside the focal point, I, but I get a virtual image on the other side. Well, it's, it's on the left side now. It's a virtual image, and it is magnified, and it's upright. This table should look very familiar, by the way. I really just took <clears throat> the same situations as for image formation by a converging mirror. Only difference here is I've defined the image distance to be positive when the image is on the opposite side because I expect the light to travel through a lens and converge on the other side if DI is positive. So if you didn't remember exactly how this goes, if you could just remember the, this table, this is a useful thing to write down and memorize and understand, you could have just looked, known your converging mirror table 
and you could have just realized that pretty much the same table applies for a converging lens with these special behaviors that happen. There's spe two special points. When you're, the object is 2F away from your optic and when it's at, at the focal point of your optic. Remember, if it's at the focal point of your optic, then all the light rays are going to end up being parallel when they go through the optic, which is no image at all. It's an image at infinity when the light rays are parallel. Let's do two examples, and then I'm going to be done for now. These are sort of plug and chug examples, but I think it captures the basic idea. I don't even have a geometric ray tracing to show where the different light rays from the object are going to go through the lens. It's a converging lens and then uh, intersect at the image, but the formula works here. I've got a lens with a focal ratio of four. I'm doing this in centimeters to try to keep it real. This could be four miles. <laughs> it could be four anythings, four inches, four meters, whatever, but in practice it's a practical problem. So I've got a lens with a four centimeter focal length and the object is, is quite some distance to the left of it, a long way. That was our first situation, so we already know what should happen. I've got my 1 over f on this side. That's known, it's given, if you just read the problem carefully. I've got my 1 over 16, and this is positive because the object distance is positive, of course. So I've got 1 16th on this side, and then I have the unknown 1 over d image, and I just have to solve this. Gave a fairly simple problem, because 1 fourth is 4 16ths. 4 16th, let's minus this from both sides, knock off 1. I have 3 16th equals 1 over di here. So then you can invert both sides and you get the correct answer. di is 16 thirds, that's the inverse of 3 16th, what? 16 thirds, or what is that? That looks like it's uh, about 5 and a third centimeters. All right, 16 thirds centimeters. And we have a real image formed on the opposite side of the lens. It is inverted. So the magnification is going to be negative. What is the magnification? That might be a, a typical uh, question I would ask you. It's a simple question. It's a one-pointer. Well, we take our formula. The image location, di, is plus 16 thirds. The original, do, was 16. There's your minus sign. And so the 16s cancel each other. I have one-third minus one-third. So yes, that's right. It is an inverted image, and it is demagnified or reduced. It's actually three times smaller image than the original object. Let's do another problem here. And um, this one is similar deal, except this time we're going to get the object closer. In fact, we're going to put the object so close that it's within the focal point. It's at smaller distance than the focal length of the lens. Focal length f is 15 centimeters. The object is now only 10 centimeters to the left of it. So d o, in this case, is actually smaller than d i. And now I want to know where the image is again. So I've got uh, two of the unknowns uh, are told to me. I've got to figure out the third one to solve for it. There's your 1 15th, 1 over f is equal to 1 over d object, 1 tenth. And then also, hmm, 1 over di. Let's look at this. 1 tenth, of course, is bigger than 1 15th, so I'm obviously going to have to subtract something here. Let's see a little bit of uh, math in our heads, arithmetic here. That would be 3 thirtieths, and this is 2 thirtieths. So 3 thirtieths minus 1 thirtieth is equal to 2 thirtieths. So this has to be minus 1 30th to solve this equation. So that means di is the inverse of that, which is minus 30 centimeters. Minus. That's because this is a virtual image. It's, the light rays did not actually converge there. They appear to have emanated from a virtual image on the left side of this lens. And it is... 30 centimeters to the left side of the lens. Wow, it's actually behind the object. The object was 15 centimeters, sorry, the object was 10 centimeters from the lens, but now the image is behind it. It's virtual and it's 30 centimeters. Because that's a minus, and there's a minus in the magnification formula, they cancel. So the image is actually three times as big as the object. It's enlarged by minus a minus 30 over 10, which is plus 3 times. 
we've actually enlarged the image now. But it's virtual, and it's actually upright, which might be useful too. That's your magnifying glass. You have to get the magnifying glass quite close to the object if you want to make an enlarged, magnified, and upright image. Right, now we're going to do some more fun things with it when you combine two lenses, which is a pretty sophisticated problem. I have seen that on the MCAT on some uh, exams, but this is the basics of it, and I'll give you maybe a few examples also to work on where f is negative. In other words, where I have a concave lens that is a diverging lens, but basically it's the same plug and chug using the same formula as we did here. So hopefully you're all set for this. Good luck.